nobody wants to admit that they don't like their child. I mean, it's your kid. You love them. And I did love Graham, but he was, uh, he was hard. He was very, very hard. Great day for both of you. We met at church doing uh, some ministry together. We were a little bit older when we got married, so we talked about having children quickly. They were going to become Christians uh, at a very early age because we were going to have them in church. I think 10 months after we were married, we had Graham. We didn't really have a comparison, so we didn't know exactly at the moment um, that, that things were different. He was just very, very, very active. He didn't have friends. They would make fun of him. We took him to the doctor, and uh, he was diagnosed with ADHD. That may be true, but there's something social that we're missing. We disciplined out of anger on several occasions. It was scary, you know, sometimes to think, what are we doing? We're spanking all the time. We're disciplined all the time. We're supposed to be having fun. We're supposed to have great relationships with our kids, and it's not turning out at all like we thought it was supposed to. At 10 years old, he was diagnosed with Asperger syndrome. But instead of like a, a terrible news, it was kind of a relief. It was like, finally, I knew there was something else. When he was probably about 12, his behavior, it just was so overwhelming. I remember just going in my bedroom and being so exasperated. I just fell down on my bed and I just began sobbing and I cried out to God and I said, God, I'm tired of asking you to help me because I can't do it. You need to do it. It was pretty amazing because I heard him say in my spirit, Graham is gonna get it. And I sat up and I looked around the room and I said, what? <laughs> and God said to me again, Graham is gonna get it. I'm glad God <laughs> gave me that at that point because it was pretty much downhill after that. Around 13, Graham began using marijuana. He began the ritual of cutting himself to relieve anxiety. He would start fires in our house and we wouldn't know it. And then it was at that point that he and his dad got in a fight. I partly think it's my fault, but he ran out and he got a, a rock and he threw it and he hit me in the head. And I said, call 911. The uh, victim of an assault has facial injuries. The police said, that's enough, and we know you're going to let him come back, but we're not. And so they actually put a restraining order on him, and he went to jail. Shortly thereafter, he had some kind of emotional breakdown. He broke into a home, and he got in trouble with a very strict county in Texas. For two years, they had him bouncing back and forth from the mental hospital to jail. I wanted Graham to have peace and have joy, and then I thought, well, Peace and joy is Jesus, that's a person. So I began to just pray, God, please let Graham experience you. But when he finally did get out, he decided that he was going to go to Colorado. He got a bus ticket. Colorado wasn't everything he thought. So he ended up hitchhiking to Portland, Oregon. We we're actually on a vacation in Mexico during this time and uh, Graham called us just half crazed. He was crying and screaming and, and mad because he had ran out of all of his medications and he was at a hospital and they wouldn't give him any more medications. I said, Graham, we can wire you some money, but there, there's nothing else we can do. He got upset, he hung up on me. And right before he hung up on me, he said, I'm gonna hurt somebody. I couldn't jump on a plane, I couldn't call him. He lost his phone, he called me from the hospital. There was nothing. This feels very bad. It feels like, it feels like the end. And so all we could do was pray. And I just told God, uh, he is so yours and he's always been yours. I want so badly to go rescue him but I know you brought me here. I believe you brought me here for a reason and you took me out of the way and I need to trust that. So please help me just to let it go and to let you do your thing with him. And amazingly, I closed my eyes and I fell asleep. We were in Cabo for two weeks. We came home and I brought my mind back to my son. 
So two and a half weeks later, I got a call from California. I answered it, and I heard Graham. He called me and he said, Mom, I lost everything. He said, I knew I didn't know anybody for thousands of miles, but I knew God. I was in Sacramento. I had just hopped a freight train down with a bunch of people from Portland. And I had this like vision. I saw like hell. And it wasn't just this place where people were eternally tortured. It was this place where people chose to do things their own way. The next day, I was so filled with compassion and love for other people that the people I was hanging out with couldn't stand to be around me. They actually kicked me out of their group. Graham had experienced God. It's pretty amazing. God showed me what my life would look like if he did heal me and what it would look like if he didn't. And the difference was extreme. And uh, he gave me a choice. He also made that choice very easy. Amazing transformation since then. Graham is off of all his medication. He's off of all drugs. He's walking with the Lord. What we've prayed at his youth has come to pass in his older age. Jesus is the only source of peace that I have found. What I used to trust God for was an outcome, it was what I was praying for, that I trust that that would happen. And now it's not about the outcome, but it's about trusting God for trusting God. He knew how far to go with Graham. He knew when and how and where Graham was gonna respond. And he did it. And I'm very, very grateful. Praise God. I know there are many people, many families who needed to see that story today about how Graham's life was transformed. That story reminds us not to give up on people. Don't give up on God and don't give up on people. People are worth it. Love them through this. You know, I think Jesus knew we may grow weary, that we would grow weary sometimes in praying, an earnest prayer. That's why in, in Luke 18, we read Jesus told his disciples a parable so they would know to always pray and never give up. And we saw in that story of that family, we see praying mom and praying dad on their knees, begging the Lord to intervene on behalf of their son, Graham. And then we see Graham's journey as he tried to fit in with people or find ways to cope with all the challenges he had. And it was said in that story that it was an overnight transformation. But perhaps we should also remember it wasn't just overnight. There were years and years of prayer for Graham. And in Graham's life, we see Revelation chapter 3, verse 20 come to life, where Jesus said, Behold, have you heard this scripture? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Whoever hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. That's fellowship, that's intimacy. So we want to pray today that the one you're praying for will hear the voice of God and answer the door as Jesus stands and knocks. And we know Jesus will not turn anyone away. He said in John 6, whoever comes to me, I will never turn away. If you're praying for someone and you've lost hope, let the story of that precious family encourage you today that God does hear and he is working even if we're not seeing it. He listens and God moves on people's hearts. And let's pray today for people to respond to the knocking on their heart by Jesus. Let me pray with you. Father God, for those who have grown weary, who those who are fainting in prayer, and they're saying, Lord, are you hearing? Where are you working here? You told us, Lord, in Luke 18, to keep on praying, 
and not faint. So Lord, we trust you today. If we don't see you working, we are trusting you are working. We know our enemy wants nothing more than for us to be discouraged and give up hope. We won't do that. We're gonna put on the armor of God as Ephesians 6 says, and we are gonna stand for that loved one. Father, right now I pray for a refreshing in your Holy Spirit for people who have grown weary and that they are gonna stand on the word of God and your promises because you are faithful. And we rebuke the enemy who lies to us. We believe the word of God and we believe the Holy Spirit is active and moving even if we don't see it. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your work and right now we lift up that loved one that loved one who is sick or that loved one who has wandered away. For some people, they don't even know where their son, their daughter, their grandson, their spouse is. But you do, Lord, and we commit, we surrender them to you now in the name of Jesus. Amen. And if you want prayer for anything, give us a call at 800-700-7000. Hello, I'm Gordon Robertson. Thanks for watching the video. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more encouraging videos like this one. Welcome to the 700 Club Interactive Family, and God bless you.